To B, the prebiotic phosphodiester bond formation problem. Another major problem that the Origin of Life research faces is how to explain the transition from monomer ribonucleotides to polynucleotides. Phosphodiester bonds are central to all life on Earth as they make up the backbone of the strands of nucleic acid. In DNA and RNA, the phosphodiester bond is the linkage between the three prime carbon atom of one sugar molecule and the five prime carbon atom of another, the oxyribose in DNA and ribose in RNA. In modern cells, in order for the phosphodiester bond to be formed and the nucleotides to be joined, the three phosphate or diphosphate forms of the nucleotide building blocks are broken apart to give off energy required to drive the enzyme catalyzed reaction. Once a single phosphate or two phosphates, pyrophosphates break apart and participate in a catalytic reaction, the phosphodiester bond is formed. The general problem regarding the condensation of small organic molecules to form macromolecules in an aqueous environment is the thermodynamically unfavorable process of water removal. In the current biosphere, these types of reactions are catalyzed by enzymes and energetically driven by pyrophosphate hydrolysis. Obviously, Biocatalysts and energy-rich inorganic phosphorus species were not extant on the Earth before life began. In all cases, the starting problem in a prebiotic synthesis would be the fact that materials would consist of an enormous amount of disparate molecules lying around unordered and would have had to be separated and sorted out. The intrinsic nature of the phosphodiester bonds is also finely tuned. For instance, the phosphodiester linkage that breaches the ribose sugar of RNA could involve the 5' OH of one ribose molecule with either the 2' OH or 3' OH of the adjacent ribose molecule. RNA exclusively makes use of 5' prime to 3' prime bonding. There are no explanations of how the right position could have been selected abiotically in a repeated manner in order to produce functional polynucleotide chains. As it turns out, the 5' prime to 3' prime linkages impart far greater stability of the RNA molecule than does the 5' prime to 2' prime bonds. Nucleotides can polymerize via condensation reactions. Ribonucleotides are shown above, but the same reaction occurs between deoxyribonucleotides. In order for a molecule to be a self-replicator, it has to be a homopolymer, of which the backbone must have the same repetitive units. They must be identical. On the prebiotic world, the generation of a homopolymer was however extremely unlikely, if not impossible. The activated nucleotides, or the nucleotides with coupling agent, now had to be polymerized. Initially, this could not have happened with a pre-existing polynucleotide template. In the case of RNA, not only must phosphodiester links be repeatedly forged, but they must ultimately connect the 5' prime oxygen of one nucleotide to the 3' prime oxygen and not the 2' prime oxygen of the next nucleotide. How could and would random events attach a phosphate group to the right position of a ribose molecule 
to provide the necessary chemical activity. A both science paper admits a fundamental requirement of the RNA world hypothesis is a plausible non-enzymatic polymerization of ribonucleotides that could occur in the prebiotic environment, but the nature of this process is still an open issue. In present-day cells, polymerization is carried out by enzymes with high efficiency and specificity. Enzymes or genetically encoded polymers requiring a complex protein-based synthetic machinery. Observe what they write at the conclusion. Selection towards highly efficient catalytic peptides, which eventually resulted in present-day enzymes, could have started at a very early stage of chemical evolution. This is an entirely unsupported claim. The readers without training in biochemistry will simply believe it without further questioning. And that is what goes on in basically the entire scientific literature that deals with origins. Nothing besides just so stories based on evolutionary guesswork. In living organisms today, Adenosine 5-3-phosphate ATP, is used for activation of nucleoside phosphate groups, but ATP would not be available for prebiotic synthesis. And Joyce and Orgel note the possible use of minerals for polymerization reactions, but then express their doubts about this possibility. 2C. Fine-tuning of the strength of the hydrogen base pairing forces. Hydrogen bond base pairing forces are essential for the mechanisms associated with DNA stability. DNA has by its own no function. Its purpose is to be used as letters, storing codified instructional complex information based on their specific sequences arranged in the DNA molecules. It is sufficiently striking already to know that the universe, its initial conditions, cosmic constants, physical laws and conditions on Earth must be finely tuned for the emergence and flourishing of life. What is less known, however, is that fine-tuning is also extending and required in biochemistry. Fine-tuning in biochemistry is represented by the strengths of the chemical bonds that makes the universal genetic code possible. Neither the transcription nor translation of the messages encoded in RNA or DNA would be possible if the strengths of the bonds had different values. Hence, life as we understand it today would not have arisen. As it happens, the average bond energy of a carbon-oxygen double bond is about 30 kilocalories per mole higher than that of a carbon-carbon or carbon-nitrogen double bond, a difference that is life essential. If it were not so, watson crick base pairing would not exist, nor would the kind of life we know. 3 the instability, degradation and asphalt problem. The chemical instability of RNA is explained by the presence of a hydroxyl group in position 2' prime of the ribose, which results in an easy strand cleavage through an intramolecular reaction. Such a cleavage is impossible in DNA, where the hydroxyl group at 2' prime is absent. An enormous amount of empirical data have established, as a rule, that organic systems, given energy and left to themselves, devolve to give uselessly complex mixtures, asphalts. In summary, the asphalt problem, also known as the tar problem, is a typical expected outcome of prebiotic processes.
randomly joined assemblies of random molecules of either covalent or hydrogen bonds should plausibly form random chaotic mixtures, not linear polymers. This has been repeatedly consistently observed experimentally. Furthermore, RNA typically degrades in a matter of days and there is no known mechanism to remove the products of degradation from the setting. Eventually, accumulated degradation products should present yet another layer of contamination. Natural processes tend to make many more wrong products than usable ones, and the ratio is plausibly large enough to prove fatal to abiogenesis. Stanley Miller concluded that the instability of ribose stemming from its carbonyl group precludes the use of ribose and other sugars as prebiotic reagents. It follows that ribose and other sugars were not components of the first genetic material. 4. The energy problem Prebiotic processes are similar in character to dumping a tank of gasoline on a car and igniting it. By contrast, living cells have machinery which converts energy appearing in a specified form into ATP, the energy currency of the cell which is useful for biotic processes. The form of energy to be converted into ATP varies among cellular types, such as UV light, visible light, methane, metallic ion flow, or digestible nutrients. Without machinery matched to the form of energy, energy tends either to have no effect or to act as a tank of gas dumped on a car. How an ordered energy supply got off the hook is a serious enigma and conundrum. It is as if a rock chose a road to roll upwards, or a rusty nail figuring out how to spontaneously rust and add layers of galvanizing zinc on itself to fight corrosion. Unintelligent simple chemicals can self-organize into instructions for building solar farms like Photosystem 1 and 2 in photosynthesis, hydroelectric dams, ATP synthase, propulsion, motor proteins, or self-repair, P53 2 more suppressed proteins, or self-destruct, as caspases, in the event that these instructions become too damaged by the way the universe usually operates. Abiogenesis is not an issue that scientists simply need more time to figure out, but a fundamental problem with materialism. 5. The minimal nucleotide quantity problem The prebiotic conditions would have had to be right for reactions to give perceptible yields of bases that could pair with each other. Even if prebiotic events would have been able to make RNA prebiotically, not only a few nucleotides would have been required, but literally trillions. A minimal cell requires a genome of at least 540,000 nucleotides. Proposing that unguided random chemical reactions events would have produced trillions of repetitive units of each type of nucleotides, all right-sized and complementary to form a double helix structure, stretches far beyond what is plausible or what chance can do. Regardless of whether the actual minimum is 100,000 or 500,000 nucleotides, this is far beyond the possible range of a prebiotic nucleic acid generating mechanism. It would theoretically eventually be able to generate a polymer with 200 nucleotides, which however soon would fall apart current understanding of information can give many explanations of the difficulties of creating it. It cannot explain where it came from. 
the prebiotic appearance of nucleotides and long polymers is more difficult than the appearance of amino acids and proteins. And even if that would occur, a chain of 200 ribonucleic acids would degrade in a matter of days. On a practical basis, the calculation of chance coming up with functional genes is nonsense. These numbers are so extreme that the human mind cannot comprehend their significance. What is required here is not some wild one-off freak of an event. It is not true to say it only had to happen once. Trillions of attempts would have had to occur to start the role of RNAs both as a catalyst and informational carrier. Prebiotic processes inherently function as random product generators producing non-functional random substrates. 6. The water paradox Water is commonly viewed as essential for life, and theories of water are well known to support this as a requirement. So are RNA, DNA and proteins. However, these biopolymers are corroded by water. For example, the hydrolytic deamination of DNA and RNA nucleobases is rapid and irreversible, as is the base catalyzed cleavage of RNA in water. This leads to a paradox. RNA requires water to do its job, but RNA cannot emerge in water and cannot replicate with sufficient fidelity in water without sophisticated repair mechanisms in place. There are no solutions in sight to solve this paradox. Life needs water that is inherently toxic to RNA necessary for life. 7. The transition problem from prebiotic to biochemical synthesis. Even if all which has been bespoken in this video occurred in a freaky accident by random events, that still says nothing about the huge gap and enormous transition that would be still ahead to arrive at the fully functional interlocked and interdependent metabolic network and information system, where complex biosynthesis pathways produce nucleotides and all basic building blocks in modern cells. The huge gap cannot be outlined enough, leading straight to the famous chicken-egg situation. Chicken and egg scenarios in cellular function can be discovered at will. The essential components of a minimal cell cooperate with each other, such that when all work together, life appears and missing any of them prevents its appearance. The gap between prebiotic chemistry and biochemistry is one of the biggest problems of abiogenesis research. Prebiotic chemistry does not resemble extant biochemistry in terms of substrates, reaction pathways, catalysts or energy coupling. The difficult condensation reactions to form nucleotides and polymers including RNA, DNA and polypeptides are accomplished in water, using energy in the form of ATP. None of this bears any resemblance to prebiotic chemistry proposals. The difficulty is extrapolating backwards from the supposed so-called last universal common ancestor, LUCA, to prebiotic chemistry. LUCA certainly had genes and proteins, and that level of complexity is undeniably a long way from prebiotic chemistry. How could chemical evolution define a proper genetic structure to instruct the make of a protein so that the protein could provide a step in the production of an essential product before all of the other proteins required in the biosynthesis pathway had appeared? There is a long list of products essential to the appearance of the first cell. Biological systems work as factories, cells, or machines, 
cells host a big number of the most various molecular machines and equal to factory production lines. DNA is transcribed to RNA, which is translated to proteins. But proteins are required to make DNA and RNA. This creates an endless loop, which is only solved when we posit that all three were created at the same time. The scenarios of prebiotic production of the basic building blocks of life are far distant from the extremely complex metabolic pathways used in even the smallest known cells like Mycoplasma genitalum. The pathway to make pyrimidines, namely cytosine and uracil, which yields RNA, and the further transformation of uracil to thymine, the base used in DNA, is extremely complex. The pathway to make purines is even more complex, as can be seen in the above picture. The pathway consists of 11 enzymatic steps. The transition from RNA to DNA is extremely complex, and one enzyme deserves to be mentioned in special, ribonucleotide reductase, which converts ribonucleotides to deoxyribonucleotides used in DNA. Ribonucleotide reductase are essential enzymes to sustain life in all free living cells, providing the only known de novo pathway for the biosynthesis of deoxyribonucleotides, the immediate precursors for DNA synthesis and repair. Consider that the making of DNA and all these extremely complex enzymes had to emerge prior when life began and without evolution. And this brings us again to the catch-22 situation as mentioned before. Essential basically means irreducible. In this exposure and video, we have not dealt with the problem of information. The fact that self-replication would only have been possible after the eigen threshold would have been overcome, and the fact that the make of proteins is an irreducibly complex process, involving besides DNA and RNA many other ingredients as listed above. A working cell is more than the sum of its parts. A functioning cell must be entirely correct at once, in all its complexity. Unguided prebiotic synthesis of RNA and DNA, an unsolved riddle. One of the more enigmatic and difficult problems confronting the prebiotic chemistry community is identifying how the monomers of RNA or pre-RNA or even non-related polymeric components selectively formed and self-assembled out of the presumed random prebiotic mixtures. It is in this assembly into informational polymers where significant selection processes must have occurred not only for the base composition but also for the other components of nucleic acids or nucleic acid alternatives and precursors. Nucleotide metabolism is central to all biological systems due to their essential role in genetic information and energy transfer, which in turn suggests its possible presence in the supposed last universal common ancestor, from which all life forms supposedly originate, that is bacteria, archaea and or eukaryotic cells. A vast number of books and scientific literature exists on this subject. For several decades, the best chemists in the world have vigorously addressed the problem of prebiotic synthesis of RNA. Their efforts, however, determined and imaginative their approaches have not been encouraging. First of all, the origin of the RNA and DNA molecules is an origin of life problem, not evolution. Evolution depends on DNA replication, therefore DNA must have preceded evolution, and therefore 
Its origin cannot be explained by evolutionary mechanisms. DNA had to emerge together with the machinery of replication and transcription as a prerequisite for kickstarting life. The supposed abiotic synthesis of RNA and thus the abiotic assembly of its components, including nucleobases as precursors, is therefore a central issue in understanding the origins of life. This observation is highly relevant because it outlines that the origin of ribonucleotides, the building blocks of DNA, could not have emerged prior to life started, but are a prerequisite. The above paper confirms this when they write. The highly conserved ribonucleotide biosynthetic pathway very likely appeared prior to the divergence of the three major lineages. RNA and ribonucleotides are ubiquitous and play key catalytic, structural and regulatory roles in biological processes. It is remarkable how the authors of the paper both then proceed by making several claims and inferences which are non sequitur based on the evidence at hand. Also, when they claim that the polyribonucleotides interacted with other compounds. Well, before even starting about interactions of what polyribonucleotides supposedly did, it has to be explained how they came to be, which the authors confess. We still do not know how the RNA world first appeared. This is a remarkable admission. But then rather than elucidating why they don't know, they move forward with further assertions lacking support entirely, despite they claim otherwise. Above is another paper which outlines that RNA and DNA had to be fully set up when life began. The authors write, thermally stable RNA is restricted to a narrow sequence space that is incompatible with the freedom of sequence information required for an RNA genome. And therefore, LUCA, that's the last universal common ancestor, must have exhibited the extant DNA-RNA dichotomy. DNA has a half-life on geologic timescales, while catalytic messenger RNA has a half-life on metabolic timescales. This paper above is worth mentioning for several reasons. As usual, it starts with the unsupported claim that nucleotides of RNA appear to be products of evolution. Then, soon after, they admit that the origin of RNA is an open question. The blatant contradiction could not be more evident. In the end, outlined in red, the authors point out that there is a vast chemical space from where the possible molecules had to be separated. Again, it is obvious that there is no reason whatsoever why natural causes without foresight nor goals would start such a selection process. The book Biological Science admits the production of nucleotides remains a serious challenge for the theory of chemical evolution. At this time, experiments that attempt to simulate early Earth environments have yet to synthesize complete nucleotides. It wonders why they call it then a theory of chemical evolution if there is no evidence for it. Paul Davis writes in the algorithmic origins of life despite the conceptual elegance of the rna world the hypothesis faces problems primarily to the immense challenge of synthesizing rna nucleotides under plausible prebiotic conditions and the susceptibility of rna oligomers to degradation via hydrolysis and leslie orgel writes the inevitable conclusion of this survey of nucleotide synthesis 
is that there is at present no convincing prebiotic total synthesis of any of the nucleotides. Many individual steps that might have contributed to the formation of nucleotides on the primitive earth have been demonstrated, but few of the reactions give high yields of products, and those that do tend to produce complex mixtures of products. Steve Banner is the founder and president of the Westheimer Corporation, a private research organization and a prior Harvard University professor. He is one of the world's leading authorities on abiogenesis. This is his evaluation of what he has observed. We are now 60 years into the modern era of prebiotic chemistry. That era has produced tens of thousands of papers attempting to define processes by which molecules that look like biology might arise from molecules that do not look like biology. For the most part, these papers report success in the sense that those papers define the term and yet the problem remains unsolved. Steve Banner has been remarkably courageous by admitting openly and categorically the origins problem cannot be solved. Long periods of time do not make life inevitable. Molecules rather disintegrate based on the second law of thermodynamics and randomization turns more complete. Since prebiotic processes are natural randomizers and abiogenesis requires specific products, it does not appear that prebiotic processes have inherent capability to meet the requirements necessitated for successful abiogenesis. This plausibly characterizes every hypothetical step of abiogenesis and explains why none have succeeded. Claude Shannon showed that randomization is the fundamental behavior and entropy is simply a mathematical expression of certain of its aspects. In 2017, English chemist John Sutherland formed nucleotides, and most all of the basic building blocks, lipids for compartments, amino acids for metabolism, starting with cyanide as a common initial substrate. However, this ended up requiring six separate ponds with their own unique geochemical conditions and whose products then needed to be mixed together in a specific sequence. Even this degree of complexity did not supply required products but only precursors. The requirement of so many unique ponds and associated chemistries in such close proximity to each other, of course, stretches plausibility. I think to say that on average the 14 hurdles that it would take to make primed nucleotides would each take 10 unit operations, and that at least 140 little events would have to be appropriately sequenced. Unguided, the appropriate thing happened at each point on one occasion in six. The odds against a successful unguided synthesis of a batch of primed nucleotides on the primitive earth would be a huge number, represented approximately by a 1 followed by 109 zeros, or 10 to the 109th power. How did nature start to play this game? At the very least, a maintained supply of primed nucleotides would be required for any kind of organism using our kind of match message tapes. A nucleotide making factory would be needed. The odds are enormous against its being coincidence. No figures could express them.